Hello. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this webinar, first of all. Um, some of you might know me as uh, mostly behind Extension Pack. So if you're using that, you probably use some of my stuff. Um, yeah. And so just to give a little bit of history, I've been using Mari for about yeah, 10 years now, ever since version one or even before that. And then, you know, like in 2012 about, I started uh, working together with another artist, Miguel Santiago. We kind of bundled up some notes and we created some notes. And from that on out, yeah, like eight years later, Extension Pack is still pretty heavily going. So we had version five now and we have about 20 releases since then. Uh, so yeah, um, and there's been a lot of work going into it. And uh, one of the talks today that I'll be, uh, the presentation I want to give is actually talk about more about the development side of Mari, um, because obviously Mari has like a super rich API that has, has been there ever since version one. So that stuff allows actually all this extra work that I'm doing, for example, with extension pack. So um, it's more actually going to be focused on that in my presentation. So it might not be the richest presentation for artists, but because I'm personally a texture artist, so I'm not a coder. So I always say like, when I can learn it, you can learn it. Um, and I definitely recommend you take a look at it. So yeah, let's check it out. First of all, thank you to the Foundry for having me on this webinar. So in this talk, I want to take a look at Mari more from a pipeline point of view. Usually we talk about it from an artist's perspective, for example, how to author materials and textures or use the node graph, layer stack, etc. But one of the big reasons Mari still is the central element of many texturing pipelines, especially in the VFX and feature animation industry, is its extendability and the fact that you can really tightly integrate it into your pipeline. In many VFX and animation studios, you will find Mari to sit in the center of texturing, where all elements end up being fed into. So this can be texture data from other applications or texture data created in Mari itself or data from libraries. It doesn't really matter. It all ends up in Mari oftentimes and is then distributed from there to the next step, which is usually looked at. Let's take a quick look at the different elements of the Mari API that allow some of this integration and extendability and some of its more high level concepts before we take a look at some practical examples where I apply them. So the Mari API can be split into several elements. The OpenGL API, which you can use to create your own custom shaders and nodes. The Python API to automate and script tools. And then sort of as a subset of some of these, there's the ability to write your own filters and blend modes, which use a combination of OpenGL and Python. Finally, there's the C API, which to my knowledge at least, is mostly used by studios to write their own geoloaders, integrate their own formats, etc. But it kind of obviously offers a lot more than that. In terms of practical applications of all these API elements, it really comes down to two fields. The first one is having Mari talk to different parts of your pipeline because it obviously does not exist in a vacuum. And the second part is making artists' life easier and give them more tools to produce the actual work inside of Mari. The pipeline part is oftentimes quite studio specific, but the general themes are usually that you want to automate your project setup. So for example, sending data from Maya into Mari and having the artist's project set up for them with correct templates, etc. You also want to manage the export locations or for example, launch a post process after exporting for texture map mapping or something like that, but also publishing. And for example, Shotgun natively comes with a Mari integration. So you can directly publish from Mari into Shotgun or use the existing framework to write your own publisher, which you can do with or without Shotgun really. Talking about publishing, especially on the bigger VFX projects where assets can sometimes have thousands of textures associated with them, exporting can be a real time factor. So oftentimes studios will go ahead and integrate Mari onto their render farm. Mari can be run like in a terminal mode. So without the UI, just via a shell. And you can also export data chunks from Mari as a separate format or as a data format and then use another machine to handle all your exporting and baking and flattening. So the artists can keep on working on their own machine without being locked out. Now the making artists life easier part is where I do a lot of work with extension pack because obviously I use Mari to create textures myself in my day job. So a lot of the time I'm just quite lazy and I want to make my own life easier and sort of as a knock on effect, others benefit from it because I embed that stuff into extension pack eventually. One of the examples of this is probably the most used feature of my extension pack and it's called the radio node system. 
So radio nodes are basically a combination of Python tools and OpenGL nodes, and they allow the artist to send data from one point in the node graph to another without having like an annoying connection line cross all the way through their graph. The way it works is by creating a so-called radio transmitter node. The transmitter basically passes data through without any processing, just shows as a lookup point in a node graph that has a unique ID. So if we look at the code of this transmitter node, you will see there's absolutely nothing happening inside there. Input is literally output. And all I really care about is this ID field at the top, which identifies the node type. The radio node itself also does very little, but it has two input ports of which only one is visible and the other one is a hidden input. On top of that whole system just sits a Python script that parses your node graph for any radio transmitter, so nodes that match that particular ID we saw earlier. And when the user chooses to connect a radio node to a selected transmitter, the Python script just creates a hidden connection between the radio transmitter and the hidden input of the radio node. Here I'm toggling the visibility of the connection line which switches the connection from the hidden input port to the visible port and back. Building the connection between the radio transmitter and the radio node itself is fairly trivial from a code point of view. So here I'm just building a list of all node IDs in your current node graph and then setting the selected radio node's input to a node, which happens here. Another more complex example of interaction between OpenGL nodes and Python scripts is the extension pack mask shelf and the content it ships with. The mask shelf allows the user to save entire graph snippets as a preset, including any image data it uses. By default, extension pack ships with around 500 presets, which include procedurals and so-called smart masks that allow you to procedurally generate wear and tear on your model. The presets introduce a high level of proceduralism into Mari, allowing you to create complex effects that otherwise would be a lot harder to achieve. If we look at this preset, for example, you can see it is built using a subgraph of custom nodes and then parameters are exposed to the node so the user has easily accessible controls. These more geometric presets are made up from a series of nodes that are part of what I call the pattern engine. These custom nodes allow you a lot of freedom and as you can see here, I can change the pattern completely very easily. You can then save this new preset to the mask shelf. And since the shelf uses a shared location on disk, other artists in the team will be able to see the new presets, making collaboration quite easily possible. Apart from adding completely new features, Mari's API also allows amending of functionalities to existing standard Mari tools. Here I'm adding presets to the template field dropdown of the material ingester tool, which is a standard Mari dialog. Mari's UI is based around the concept of actions. Each item in the UI is an action that can be searched, removed, and replaced via scripts. By replacing the standard Mari material ingester actions in the menu with my own created action, I can edit settings each time it is launched and then call the original ingester action in the end. This is a great way to make subtle enhancements to Mari without the user having to use different tools than they're used to. To wrap this up, let me show you a time-lapse video of some actual texture work where we can see a variety of enhancements made using the API elements we discussed. I'm using here a series of material templates that have been added to the Mari shelf on startup using the shelf Python API. By launching scripts whenever the user is in transfer mode, I'm able to dynamically add standard Mari locators to the material, making it possible to directly modify their projections in the viewport without having to manually create these locators first. Using the standard Mari texture set palette, I'm loading Megascans materials here into the image manager. From there, I'm ingesting them into my materials using a custom tool and user customizable naming conventions, which quite greatly reduces the time to apply such library data. Since all attributes of a layer or node are scriptable, you always have full control over all elements of a node by the API, which is how I'm achieving this. So if you haven't looked at the API, I would definitely recommend you do so. Even if you're an artist with basic Python skills, it'll help you a lot to automate certain tasks. And I'm not a coder either, so if I can do it, you can do it. So yeah, that wraps it for me, and thank you for listening.